Welcome to episode 269 of Real Health Radio. You can find the show notes and the links talked about as part of this episode at 7, so the word all spelled out, S-E-V-E-N hyphen health.com forward slash 269. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Real Health Radio. I'm your host Chris Sandal. I'm a nutritionist and a coach and I can help you to fully recover from disordered eating or an eating disorder so that your days are no longer governed by fear and anxiety and instead you can live a meaningful life that is in alignment with your values. And before I get started with today's episode, I just want to mention that I'm currently taking on clients and at the time of recording this intro, I have just one spot left. So client work is the core of my business and is the thing I actually enjoy the most. And after working with clients for 15 years, I feel confident in saying I'm very good at what I do. So if you want to get unstuck and reach a place of full recovery, then I would love to help. You can head over to 7-health.com forward slash help. And there you can read about how I work with clients and apply for a free recovery strategy call. And the address again is 7-health.com forward slash help, and I'll put a link to that in the show notes. So on to today's show. This week, it is a guest interview, and my guest today is Noreen Hanani. So Noreen is the founder of RDs for Neurodiversity and a neurodivergent registered dietitian with 18 years of experience. In her private practice, she treats children and families struggling with a variety of feeding challenges through a trauma-informed, weight-inclusive, and anti-oppressive approach. She has extensive experience working with neurodivergent people and has the privilege of sharing her knowledge and expertise at national and international conferences. She also had the honor of developing courses and training for healthcare professionals, teachers, and therapists. So I discovered Noreen and RD for Neurodiversity last year. Uh, Laura Thomas, the host of the former Don't Sort My Game podcast, has a new podcast called Can I Have Another Snack? And Noreen was one of the guests on that show. And as part of this episode, we talk about Noreen's background and how she got into being a dietitian and her experience with the training she received. She talks about having kids who are neurodivergent and how this caused a shift in the kind of clients that she was working with and really sparked the interest in this area and how it also led to her discovering she was neurodivergent. We cover her site, RDs for Neurodiversity, so what the site is and and why Noreen set it up. And we also cover trauma-informed care and how we need to rethink what trauma means when we think about neurodiversity. This is a shorter conversation than usual, but it is no less helpful. I'm a huge fan of what Noreen is doing and want more people to be aware of her site, RDs for Neurodiversity. And I should also note that it was because of Noreen and her site that I found Stacey Finelli, and I talked to her in episode 262 of the podcast, where we go into eating disorder recovery and neurodiversity, and we go into that in a huge amount of detail. So if you haven't listened to that episode yet, yet, then I highly suggest you do. I'll add it to the show notes. And again, it's episode 262. I will be back at the end with a couple of recommendations. But for now, let's get on with the show. Here is my conversation with Noreen Hunani. Hey, Noreen, welcome to Real Health Radio. I'm excited to be chatting with you today. Thank you for for having me on your podcast. So I've become aware of you because of your site, RDs for Neurodiversity, which I love. And so a lot of today's conversation is going to revolve around the topic of neurodiversity, your experience with it, and the work that you're also doing in this area. And I guess just as a starting place, do you want to give listeners a bit of background on yourself? So who you are, what you do, what training you've done, that kind of thing? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So I um, am a multiply neurodivergent um, dietitian and activist. And so I guess my background is in dietetics, human nutrition. I graduated from McGill University almost 18 years ago. I have a private practice in Montreal, Canada, where I support um, children, adults, families with various feeding and eating concerns. And about two years ago, I founded RDs for Neurodiversity, the platform that you just mentioned, which is a neurodivergent affirming online continuing education platform for providers. Mm -hmm. Nice. 
And so if we kind of just stick with you for a moment, like if we go back, like what was your relationship with food like as a, as a kid? Yeah, I, I find that to be such an interesting question. I grew up in Pakistan and fortunately, you know, my parents didn't face a lot of the struggles that many parents do now, especially in the Western culture in North America. Like that's where I am. So it's, it's very interesting when I reflect, you know, and, and think back. I mean, I, I think I grew up, you know, having really positive experiences with food. Yeah. I have great, um, fun memories. Uh, food is definitely a huge part of our culture. Yeah. Um, my dad owned a restaurant, so we were always very exposed to a variety of cuisine from all over the world. And, um, it's interesting, you know, because even though it was a huge part, of, it's a huge part of our culture and a, a huge part of my childhood. There wasn't like a hyper focus on it, like what we see the the, the, the fixation yeah. that we're seeing now with with a lot of the the parents. So yeah. you know, I mean, it was great when when I I was offered like my favorite dishes, and sometimes you know we just had dinner. We would eat because well, you have to eat, you know. So sometimes the food was not you know, the best choice or my preferred food or whatever. But but definitely, I mean, I have really pleasant, you know, memories um, around food. And, and, and from a cultural perspective, food is definitely a huge part of the South Asian um, culture. Okay. And so when did you move to Canada and what was that experience like? Yeah. So I moved to Canada when I was 10 with my parents and two siblings and uh, that, that was a very interesting experience. And I think a lot of, I guess my relationship with food like did start to change as, you know, um, went to school here, yeah. college, university, because obviously you see that, well, there are certain types of foods that are that are kind of valued here and certain types of eating. I remember like... Um, you know, in university, a lot of the lectures, like there was no representation, BIPOC representation, really. The majority of um, my teachers didn't, well, none of them really looked like me. So, and on top of it, a lot of the um, cultural foods are demonized and pathologized in the um, Western culture, um, labeled as, you know, unhealthy or refined or... So that was a very... That was a very interesting experience because I didn't know how much that negatively impacted my relationship with food until much later on because I was just trying to, you know, comply and fit in and learn. I mean, I love, I I love to learn new knowledge and um, yeah. So as I reflect back, I feel like a lot of this, the the questioning, <laughs> um, you know, around well, am I eating the right food? Really starts to happen during university for me. Okay, and were you ever putting your hand up and and disagreeing with anything that was being said, or that's just not your personality type? And and so you were just like whatever the the lecturer said about your your foods were was kind of you just took their point of view. Yeah, no, it's interesting because certain things, I, I mean, I was one of those students who always sat in the front. I mean, I'm neurodivergent and sitting in the back with all the distractions and all of that didn't work for me. So I was always like the student in the front asking a lot of questions, but not necessarily, you know, questioning why cultural foods were demonized. And to be honest, during that experience, I didn't really fully understand what was happening until much later, Yeah, right? Because the Eurocentric diet is something that's put on the pedestal here in North America. Like this is how you should be eating, and so I, 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 I didn't really fully understand the racism and all of those, you know, subtle, <laughs> you know, things that were happening in, in in the classroom until until much later, honestly. So I was just like, I'm going to be a good student, <laughs> and then I remember going home and telling my mom while well, you're putting too much oil and you shouldn't be cooking with this. And, you know, our vegetables are not good because we cook a lot of our vegetables. We don't really, in our culture, we don't eat a whole, I mean, we do have some like raw fruit and vegetables, but a lot of our vegetables are cooked. And I just yeah. remember just kind of learning a lot of this information and going back home and just telling my mom and kind of 
starting to police her a little bit, like you need to be, you know, healthier and and whatnot. So yeah, I mean, I'm I'm so glad that you know over the years I was able to process what happened and how you know problematic the system is and how we're taught um you know here especially in in North America yeah yeah and even like when I reflect on my nutrition education like my everything was like one week okay milk's bad and then the next week this thing's bad and so just there was so much chopping and changing of things (laughs) until much later on where I when I had a much broader view of everything but I do just remember how much that the, the education would start to impact on my on my beliefs because they're, they're trying to teach you new ideas that that are now quite questionable absolutely and you know as much as like you know i mean my program was it, it was um a bachelor of science and you know we go a lot of us went into it because we're passionate about science and health but like critical thinking is not something that's encouraged it's really yeah. is about compliance and yep. prescriptive approaches. So you're not necessarily encouraged to to question anything, right? Yeah. And so like I know for for myself like as a neurodivergent person, like it is not safe for me to start questioning even in an in an environment where you know we are not supposed to ask questions, right? Yep. So I think that's an environment that we need to cultivate, but that's not something that's cultivated in school where it's really all about compliance and, you know, very like authoritative, like it's it's about, you know, the power dynamics, um, even, you know, when it comes to student teacher and how that shows up, it's, um, it can be a scary place. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, the so many of us, you know, there were quite a few actually um, BIPOC students because there are a lot of international students that are very attracted to, um, to McGill. And, you know, uh, none of us really questioned anything really yeah. until much later. Yeah. And so what area did you want to go into so when you were first starting as a dietitian what was the the specialty that you wanted to work in so when I initially graduated I knew that I wanted to have private practice at some point okay Um, that's something that really appealed to me and I was pretty sure that I wanted to specialize um in supporting like adults like I didn't really have an interest at that time in working with children so that's what I did for five years and um, had a private practice and got several opportunities to, to work in different environments. So basically um, long-term care, rehab centers, um, hospital setting, community. Like I did a lot of different food service. Yeah. I was really, and this is again, something, you know, when I look back, like I feel like I need a lot more stimulation compared to my colleagues. And so this is what kind of kept me going. And then there was a point when I realized, well, maybe this is not for me because it just didn't feel right. Um, I was, when I graduated, I was pretty much uh, working within like a weed centric model. And at some point I was just like, what is really going on? No one is, I can't help anyone because people were not able to sustain weight loss. A lot of what I worked on was what I supported folks was, was weight loss. And yeah. for that's what we're taught. Right. So, and then I realized I, I don't, I don't, I can't do this anymore because I just did not feel satif- satisfied. I, I just didn't feel right telling people what to eat, taking away, you know, pleasure from them yeah. um, and uh, policing folks, you know, so it, it just didn't feel right. And then and had you um, then discovered like health at every size and yes. anti diet at that at that point? Yeah, exactly. And that's what like saved my career, I guess, <laughs> at that point. You know, until I started realizing that there are a lot of challenges in that area too, um, as well. And 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 so yeah. So initially, that's what really you know made me stay because it just felt like so liberating to not have to you know tell people what to eat and not demonize and really support people in a way that you know felt affirming um yeah yeah. and so I said at the top like I I found you because of your site 
RDs for neurodiversity. And neurodiversity is something that I've become more aware of with clients probably in the last handful of years. And so mm-hmm. when did you first become aware of this? Like when did it come on your radar or something you wanted to be investigating? For me personally? Me? Well, I just whether whatever came first. So it was either with you yeah. personally or it was because of the, the work you were doing as an RD. Like how, how did it first show up for you? Yeah, so I actually, so like I mentioned earlier in my career, I was working with adults and realized that I would never work with children. And then I ended up becoming a parent and my uh, my kids are neurodivergent. That's what really led me to kind of explore a little bit like, okay, well, what is, you know, how can I be an affirming parent? How can I support my children? And uh, both of my kids had have feeding differences. And initially feeding was difficult. And when I had questions and I I, I looked for support, like no one could really support me in a way that felt good. So that's when I started to really look into, well, how can I support my neurodivergent children and really realizing that, well, these feeding differences that, that I'm seeing are really related to their neurodivergence. And so, well, how do I support that? And and really started to specialize in peds, I would say almost like over a decade ago, um, because of the needs of my own family. And, and that's when I started to kind of open up my practice to, to peds and, and started seeing more and more children. And so many kids that were showing up that with feeding differences were also neurodivergent. Yeah. So that's how, I, that's how I got introduced. I would say it's a very long story. it's like a shorter version (laughs) sure and and what were some of the feeding challenges that you were you were noticing with your kids and look i i I should also just say like i I have a five-year-old son he is neurodivergent and so we've had various challenges uh depending on like connected to food connected to to other things so i'm i'm also happy to to share yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it's just like, I think that for me, honestly, when I look back, what what the challenges were not really challenges, but there were challenges when you live in a society that is steeped in norm- neuronormativity and, and, and throws all these shoulds at you, right? Yeah. Uh, and neurotypical like milestones, because to be honest, feeding differences are very common in my family. Like I, if I reflect, there's so many members of my family you know, that like, that have like different ways of eating, but this is not something that we necessarily like pathologize. Yeah. But when you're given like this guide, (laughs) like this is how it should be. And like by 12 months, your child should be able to eat like the rest of the family and they should be able to eat a variety of textures. Like when we start throwing shoulds at people, it is really paralyzing and it like disconnects people from their like own like intuition. Yeah. And this is what like, you know, in my opinion, like the medical industrial complex thrives on. Yeah. And, you know, these, these, these challenges, right? Like were only challenges because of the environment I was raising my children. Yeah. In, right. And as soon as I started to like, okay, adjust the environment and also kind of understand, well, it's okay if children develop differently. It's okay if they can't eat like a whole lot of textures you know, there's certain foods, my, my kids, like it just takes them a really long time to chew. And that's related to like their oral motor um, differences and oral motor planning needs. And like, no, they don't have to eat like raw carrots if it takes them 10 hours to chew them, you know? So it's things like that, that I started to kind of challenge and really, you know, growing up, like I was always encouraged by my father to think critically. And, you know, the education system took that away from me for a little bit. But yeah. I was able to kind of gain that back because I had to be an advocate for my kids. So, nice. yeah, all that wisdom was there. It was just needed <laughs> for a bit because, you know, I had to survive the education system. But then I started to listen again to my own voice. And that really helped me advocate for my kids and, and my clients as well. Nice. Yeah, that's great. It was, it's like from from our, our experience here, our son, we did baby led weaning and he ate everything and it was great and we and and like i was really picky as a a kid and he was eating everything and we're like oh cool we've got we've got this nailed and then at about two and a half everything just changed 
and mm-hmm. we had quite a long uh, a long stretch of everything being very very beige and even now th- there's a lot of limits on on what will be will be eaten i know you had a, a great post recently on on your instagram about like something to do with like making separate meals for the family and actually that that's an okay thing and that's often what has to happen here that we mm-hmm. will make something different for him because that's just what has to happen for him to to eat because he has limited mm-hmm. stuff that that he will he will eat and i i feel very grateful that i went into this with a good relationship with food myself that my wife has a good relationship with food we already knew about ellen satter's division of responsibility and also just not getting neurotic about the nutrition side of everything and and just being able to take a, a bigger picture approach of like it's more important that we have a healthy relationship with him than getting him to eat particular foods. Absolutely. Absolutely. And yes, it's, you know, like the idea that feeding has to look a certain way for, for all families. It just doesn't work for a lot of neurodivergent families. And, you know, the important thing is really prioritizing, you know, the feeding relationship and safety. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, Am I correct in in thinking as well that it was through like looking at your children's neurodivergence uh, that you discovered your own neurodiversity? Yes, but it took me a while. (laughs) Okay. So can you talk about that experience? (laughs) Yes, absolutely. Um, You know, it's so interesting because, I mean, I'm a neurodivergent person. I was born this way. This is how I've been my whole life. But, you know, when we talk about, neurodivergence and we talk about like specifically like you know autism ADHD learning disability right like there are certain like profiles that were shown like this is how it should look like or this is what it looks like and a lot of the studies also you know are are done on young boys so women in neurodivergence this is something that hasn't been explored until very very recently yeah. And so it took me a while because, well, all we see is, well, what, what, you know, how it presents in, in young, young children. Right. And so it's really, really difficult when you don't have, when you're not provided <laughs> the, the right information. And so eventually what happened was I started to, through social media, connecting with a lot of neurodivergent parents and groups for neurodivergent uh, folks and groups for parents of neurodivergent children. And a lot of these groups were run by parents that were also neurodivergent and, you know, adults sharing their experiences. And I was like, well, wow, I see a lot of myself in in this, you know, like this really resonates like with me and my experiences. So, Eventually, yes, I did, you know, started to question on and and really, again, it took some time to get there because you don't, you just don't have a lot of resources and not many professionals even, you know, specialize in, in assessing adults, yeah. um, AFAB women, you know, like it's really, it, it's so complicated. So it did take me time and I wish it didn't take me that much time because it was one of the most liberating thing for me um, to be able to really have a name for my experience and to be able to relate to others who also, you know, have similarities and, and kind of interact with the world in a, in a similar way. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I think, as I said, this is a, a topic I've been looking into more for the last couple of years and I think in the same way as we have this very stereotypical view of what certain eating disorders look like we have a very stereotypical view of what different neurodivergent types look like and for so many of my clients who are females it's them finding in their 30s or 40s or even 50s that that actually this is this is them and and I think one of the things that comes up a lot is because of just the masking that that happens and that for for females there is more of this fitting in that happens 
that isn't necessarily so prominent with with the boys or the men with this. Um, that's just something that I've, I've noticed. And so, yeah, it, it becomes a lot more internalized. And so many of my clients, when they've shared this with friends, that the response is like, I, I, I don't know, I would never have, I would never have picked that. Um, and so I don't know if that if that is something that you've noticed. Yes, I you know, it's just so interesting, because like, it's such an I find it's such an interesting time. So many of us are like openly talking about our experiences, yeah. you know, and neurodivergent studies are are also offering like a lot of perspective. For me personally, I think that, you know, my experience was, well, after have, becoming a parent, like demands really increase significantly. Like we're able to manage and mask and do a lot, you know, even the executive functioning demands yeah. increase significantly when you become a parent. And you know, it just becomes really, really hard to cope. Yeah. And I feel like for me, that was like a huge moment as well, where, you know, it it was just so difficult, like the whole sensory experience becoming a parent and, and like the, the noise and and the diapers and all that stuff, you know, like constant sensory overload. And, and because like, I didn't have the language, I would just think that I'm just anxious. Yeah. Right. And that's what a lot of us experience, like a lot of adults that are in neurodivergence and, you know, anxiety is also a form of neurodivergence, but like a lot of us have like other forms of neurodivergencies that are just not diagnosed and everything is just labeled as like anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. No, I would definitely agree with that with, with a lot of clients. It's just been this kind of blanket term of anxiety. And then when we start to, to really understand the the different sensitivities, et cetera, it then there's a lot more color to this than just anxiety. And so what was your reason for wanting to start RDs for Neurodiversity? So the reason why I started RDs for Neurodiversity was as I started doing this work, I mean, I'm I'm located in Canada, but like people from like all over started to kind of to approach me because of you know what I had to say was so different. Right. Yep. And there was openness, thankfully, which, you know, allowed me to speak on several platforms and share, you know, a lot of what I experienced and, 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 you know, my, uh, model. And, and so eventually I, I realized that there is a huge need to have a platform. Yeah. You know, a, a space where, People can access weight inclusive and neurodiversity affirming courses and resources. So that was like one reason where I felt like there was a huge need. People were open and I was constantly getting uh, requests to like speak and, and, and share my um, expertise. And so that was one reason. And the other reason why I wanted to start this platform is because there's so many neurodivergent providers out there as well that, you know, feel incredibly isolated. And I wanted to offer a platform for providers as well, where they can also kind of like share their knowledge and wisdom. So I offer series where I invite like people, providers of all different backgrounds in, and the majority of the speakers are neurodivergent themselves. Yep. So I felt like it would be really nice to kind of build a community and network this way. Nice. And so what is the like neurodivergent affirming model? Yes. So the neuro uh, the neurodiversity affirming model I created over the years and it's basically not a model that is prescriptive because a lot of the models out there and frameworks and, you know, best practices and all of that is it's a lot of very prescriptive, like step-by-step kind of approach, which doesn't yeah. work for people with divergent <laughs> minds. And yeah. so I wanted to really focus on offering care that was, that's really like focused based on inclusion and acceptance. Right. Yeah. So it's it's an anti um oppressive uh, methodology that's like informed by social justice education disability justice um neurodiversity studies 
And it was developed really to intervene against the current oppressive models that center individualism and that are fat phobic and ableist. Nice. And is this then like at the core of everything that's that's taught through through your site? So I mean it's it's the the I guess the essence, yes. Because for for I think, you know, a huge if I look at like the current culture environment, if we're looking at like haze aligned spaces and weight inclusive spaces, ableism is not something that is ever <laughs> talked about, right? So I think it's really important to bring in the disability justice piece yeah. and the, uh, the anti, um, you know, uh, ableism piece. So yes, it's it's the foundation and 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 the majority of like pretty much all the courses that I I teach align with this model, and when I do invite speakers, you know it's really important for me to know that we you know we have similar like philosophies and ways of working just to just so we don't create like you know confusion. Yeah. Okay. And I know on your site you talk about with for, uh, trauma informed care. You, you want to move beyond the ACEs and looking at non-traditional forms of trauma. So can you just talk a little more about this? Yes, absolutely. So, you know, when we talk about like trauma-informed care, especially in like the context of like when we look at like uh, the pediatric population, you know, often we we refer and and and, and reflect on the the study, the adverse um, childhood um, event study, right? And that looks yeah. at you know, variety of factors. Now, when we look at trauma and stress for neurodivergent people, it's, 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 it's very unique because often it's an ongoing, it's ongoing trauma, right? Ongoing tr- stress for, for the majority of us, right? Yeah. And, you know, we don't think about like sensory, you know, aversion as a form of trauma, right? We're trying to navigate different environments where our sensory needs are not met is, 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 is traumatizing, right? Yeah. Social bullying, social trauma that comes from, you know, being different or, or communication. A lot of us communicate differently and that, you know, so this is like an ongoing challenge that a lot of us face, which impacts like the way we, uh, view ourselves the way we um, view our bodies. It also impacts our ability to access food. So it's all very much, you know, connected. So I'm hoping to bring more awareness to this piece, expand a little bit in terms of what trauma-informed care can look like, yeah. and really looking at all the different pieces and how how they show up and how they are connected. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And when you think about this piece, were, were there some specifics of things you tr- you tried or helped with your with your kids to to try and protect them from from that pro- trauma? Well, I mean, it's it's definitely neurodivergent parenting is very different yeah. than how you know we're told to kind of parent, right? And it's interesting because I'm I've been having a lot more conversations around like authoritative parenting, which is supposed to be like, again, like the gold standard. And like for a lot of kids that can feel like gaslighting, like if you listen to your needs, but then you end up doing what you think is right. And that 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 does not work for a lot of kids. And kids who are not, you know, who are given a voice, right? Yeah. They will advocate for themselves. They will question you and that's what you know my children do they question me all the time and a lot of the answers you know like the why you have to ask the why like why do we want them to behave a certain way or or do things a certain way and a lot of it relates to like this it's social construct right like it's it all has to do with fitting in and functioning a certain way which again is steeped in like neuronormativity right so i think that you know when we truly embrace ch- our children for who they are, right? It can be really a, a, a beautiful thing and it can be very liberating. But yeah. at the same time, we know our kids have to go outside, <laughs> right? And have to kind of figure out how to function and also live in the society, right? Yeah. So definitely we can equip them 
and support them. But like the idea that they have to change who they are to fit in is traumatic. But that's what a lot of the neurodivergent adults are dealing with, right? It's just the unmasking and trying to figure out, well, who are we really? (laughs) You know, we have been trained to function a certain way that's not working for us, right? So how can we, you know, find that authenticity and be more like authentic? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, this is a question I'm constantly asking myself as a parent, because it's that trying to figure out, okay, when is some level of push useful because that then turns into, okay, I I figured out I could do this difficult thing and and I'm really grateful for that versus actually this is just too much and this is not helpful and this is creating overwhelm and and, and stress. And I mean, like with our our son Ramsey at at this point, we're home educating. I don't know if that will be forever, but at, at this point, him going to a school and sitting in a classroom would be incredibly traumatizing for him. And I don't know, he, he wouldn't be able to, to do that. And mm-hmm. so we've made the decision at this point to, to do home education. And, and I feel very privileged to be able to do that, but it's just one of the, like the many things that I, I think about as a parent of like, how do I create the right kind of environment that does then allow him to be the best adult that he's then going to be able to to be and to have the the experiences that that really allow him to to be that person yes and that is what i find so beautiful i think that you know parents taking control and really making decisions that are you know right for for their families for their children is such a powerful thing i think this is how we're going to change our culture this is how we're going to embrace neurodivergent culture right yes so many parents choose to homeschool and school like they're because yeah. they see they see what's happening and a lot of our children just cannot survive yeah. um in these environments so yeah definitely i think it's it's great that you're able to to do this yeah and it look i mean something it was never on my radar like i never even considered this i didn't i it just wasn't even something that i thought about when I was growing up because it wasn't something I I needed but it just is is so apparent that that is the the right way for us to be dealing with this at at this point Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and can you talk about the the neurodivergent nest which I know is part of your site yes so the neurodivergent nest um is a peer support group that I offer And it's open to neurodivergent providers to connect, be in community with each other. Like I mentioned, there's the, you know, so many of us feel so isolated. A lot of us are not openly neurodivergent because it's not safe uh, for us to be openly neurodivergent. And so there is such a need and burnout. I mean, a lot of us are, you know, constantly struggling with that. So I wanted to offer uh, a space where providers can connect and be in community and rejuvenate and yeah, find, find joy. And really, it's a really wonderful group. And um, it's something that, you know, I, I absolutely love, love offering. Nice. Well, I'm, I'm glad that, that you do offer it. And I'm, I'm so glad that you've set up this side and you're, you're doing what you're doing. Where can people go if they want to find out more about you, Noreen? Yeah, so I have two accounts on social media. So for my private practice, it's Noreen Honani Nutrition. I'm not super active uh, there, but I do post every now and then. And then there is the um, RDs for Neurodiversity platform. And I have a Facebook page and uh, I'm also on Instagram. And that's where I'm more active um, these days. Mm-hmm. Okay, perfect. Well, I will put all of those links in the show notes. And yeah, thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed chatting with you. Thank you so much. And thank you for your wonderful questions. So that was my conversation with Noreen. If you or your kids are neurodivergent, I highly suggest checking out her site. Or if you are a dietitian or a therapist or a nutritionist, then I also highly recommend checking it out. So I have two recommendations of things to watch. 
And while they are different, I kind of put them into a similar category, with the category being hobbies or passions that aren't mainstream, but for the participants, they have a huge impact on their life and is also part of their identity. So the first documentary is called Skip Stones for Fudge, and it's all about the sport of stone skipping. And you've probably picked up a stone before and tried to skip it across a pond or a lake, like I know I have, and maybe it skips for a couple of times and then falls into water and that's it. Well, what these guys are able to do it just seems to defy the laws of physics. They throw a stone and it just keeps going and going and going. So the documentary follows a number of the best stone skippers in the world as they each try and win different tournaments and also each try and get into the Guinness Book World Records for for uh, a stone skip that they've caught on camera. And there's something very simple about this documentary. And it's definitely not the best documentary that I've ever watched, but there's something about the affinity that these people have for stone skipping. And for one of the main people who lives a very simple and and fairly isolated life, stone skipping is how he fills his time. And it's just a really interesting story to think about, at least from my perspective, thinking about what his life would be like if he wasn't into stone skipping, because it is such a, a big part of his life. It's only 50 minutes long, and you can watch it for free on YouTube. And from my perspective, it's well worth a watch, and I still cannot get my head around how they're able to get a stone to go as far as it does. And so it's called Skip Stones for Fudge. And then the second documentary is called The Speed Cubers, and is all about the world of speed-solving Rubik's Cubes. And like Skipping Stones, this is an obscure and niche sport, And just like with Skipping Stones, I also can't get my head around how quickly they are able to solve the cubes. And the story mostly focuses on two of the best speed cubers in the world and the two guys who hold all of the Guinness World Records for speed cubing. And it's a really sweet story. So one of the guys, Max Park, is autistic and that has had a huge impact on his life. And it's really through discovering the Rubik's Cube and then starting to go to tournaments that his life greatly expands. And a big part of this is because of Felix, who is the other main competitor, who is incredibly supportive of Max. And despite the fact that one lives in Australia and the other lives in the US, they have this really great friendship. And so I enjoyed this film because... I got to learn about this niche sport or hobby and had my mind blown with what they're able to do, but also because it really does show the best of humanity and how common interests can bring people together and common interests, not of things that we hate together, but common interests of something that we both really love and are passionate about. So it's called Speed Cubers and it's on Netflix. So that's it for this week's show. As I mentioned at the top, I have one spot left in my private practice right now. If you're wanting to recover from an eating disorder and you want to reach a place of full recovery, I'd love to support you in this. You can head to 7-health.com forward slash help for more information. I'll be back next week with another episode. Take care and I'll catch you then.